Thank you, Shlomo. I'm, I'm going to open it up momentarily to questions. I would just like to recognize the Egyptian ambassador to the UN, Majid Abdelaziz, and the PLO ambassador to the UN, Riyad Mansour, who are, who are here with us. I, I'll also just relay one of the more amusing moments of, 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 of our last days and our meeting in Washington. We were we were in the office of uh, Senator Bob Casey of Pennsylvania, and Shlomo is explaining the problem with the Philadelphia corridor. And uh, <laughs> and the eyes lit up, and they're, oh no, Pennsylvania's got enough problems at the moment. We don't, <laughs> we don't, we're not stuck in the middle of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as well, are we? They were calmed down when Shlomo explained that that, of course, was the border area running between uh, Egyptian Rafah and Palestinian Rafah. Um, I, I very much appreciate, Shlomo, you, the way you're addressing the two shortcomings, uh, potentially significant ones, of the Annapolis process, which is the security deficit and the legitimacy deficit. Uh, the security deficit being addressed initially, at least, by a ceasefire. Uh, my fear is that the ceasefire that we're looking at at the moment is in the most minimalist sense, which is both sides stop firing. To lock in a ceasefire, I think one would have to address the point Shlomo raised, which is on the Israeli side, to get sufficient satisfaction that there will not be a free flow of weapons uh, into uh, the Gaza Strip. From the Palestinian side, I think to lock in a ceasefire, there needs to be sufficient satisfaction that the, the blockade on Gaza does not continue. For I, I don't see a... Uh, Hamas um, willingness to embrace a uh, cessation of fire while there is still a, a siege imposed and an inability to govern and, 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 and the destitute uh, socioeconomic uh, situation in Gaza and the legitimacy deficit, um, which is, of course, this, this question of, uh, of the inclusiveness of, of the process. And I think on the Israeli side, the legitimacy deficit is, is addressed also by a more robust American role. I, I would like to, to, to jump in and, and, and abuse my position here with, with the following question, Shlomo. Where does the other regional actors, in particular Syria and Iran, where would they fit into that equation and what would the impact of current or a different policy vis-a-vis -vis those actors uh, have on the scenario that you, that you laid out for us? <coughs> Well, Israel has always had a problem in conducting two peace processes at a time. And uh, traditionally, uh, I, I'm referring to Syria, obviously, uh, traditionally, uh, the Israeli, uh, uh, Israeli politicians and leaders preferred to go for peace with, uh, with the Arab states because of the difficulties entailing, entailed in, the, in, in negotiations with the Palestinians and, and the nature of the, of the issues that are at stake. Uh, it is easier to address, as I said before, a real estate uh, issue than an issue that has uh, Jerusalem and uh, holy sites and refugees. And, uh, and therefore, uh, there is a split now in the Israel. Well, not really a split, because uh, indeed the, the defense minister is interested in, in going for a deal with Syria, and he has said it many times, but I am uh, aware of uh, um, the interest of the prime minister as well. Uh, they have tried a, a Turkish... Uh, Channel to with the with um, uh, with the Syrians, and uh, the impression is that this is not a channel that is producing, but it only shows that uh, they are ready to uh, have uh, um, talks with the Syrians as well. Now the 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 question with the Syrians if, uh, and and the Iranians and Hamas, with all difference between all all all, all these three actors is that we, the Israelis, and you, the Americans, uh, we address them in, a, in, a, um, in the same way, and this is a way that doesn't work. It didn't work. We put preconditions. We say to the Iranians, uh, stop enrichment, and we will negotiate with you. And meanwhile, they are very close to, uh, to uh, enough uh, enriched material to produce a bomb. So the, 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 the concept did not work. We come to Hamas and we say to Hamas, recognize the state of Israel, um, recognize uh, previous agreements, stop violence, and then we will negotiate with you, recognize you. Uh, it doesn't happen. 
We would like it to happen. It doesn't happen. And to the Syrians we say, uh, disengage from, uh, from Iran, s close the offices of Hamas in Damascus, and uh, uh, stop supporting Hezbollah. And then we will negotiate with you. It doesn't happen. <laughs> so we can persist in our, f in our, in our ideological or tactical uh, uh, positions. We can persist. But the question is that whether or not they give results. They do not give results. And uh, one must be impressed by the resilience of a movement like Hamas, uh, under siege and, uh, and surrounded and, uh, and incapable of providing basic necessities to, to those who voted for them. And nonetheless, they, have, they haven't ch changed their position. So I think that maybe we should try a different, a different approach. And these are assets that these people might be able or should be able to give as the result, as the outcome of the negotiations, not as a precondition of the negotiations. Um, so this is, uh, this is my view. My view is not ideological. I think this is not about ideology. This is not about bad or good guys. This is about a pragmatic decision. What do you do to solve the problem? You do not have answers to Qassam missiles. You do not have answers to the challenge of Hamas as it is today. The challenge of Hamas is derailing the peace process, which is the last chance of the two-state solution. What do you do? That's the question. And I think that what you do is twist a bit your principles and try uh, uh, to reach a settlement, perhaps not through direct negotiations. We have third parties. The Egyptians are doing an excellent work. I think that, that uh, Abu Mazen could be uh, uh, a third party to negotiate with, with Hamas. By the way, he did it to facilitate Sharon's disengagement from Gaza. It was Abu Mazen that brokered with Hamas uh, um, a non-official ceasefire to, to allow for a, for a smooth disengagement. So I think that we need to adapt our strategies to the, to, the conditions, to the conditions on the ground. Now, Iran uh, obviously um, is a challenge, uh, both to Israel, but not less so to the Arab world. This is, a, this is a major problem also for the Arab world if Iran becomes uh, uh, nuclear. When uh, uh, Rabin uh, coined that expression, I think it was an expression of Baker, not of Rabin, of window of opportunity, um, or at least it was identified very much with Rabin, what he meant by that is that the Soviet Union has collapsed, Islamic fundamentalism hasn't yet become the formidable challenge that it is today, and Iran is not nuclear. This is the window of opportunity. Well, okay, in some ways there is a changing face of the same window of opportunity, slightly narrower or perhaps even quite narrower, Yet, there is still a possibility to do it before uh, Iran becomes a nuclear power. Uh, peace with the, with the, with the, uh, with the uh, Palestinians is very important for regional stability as well. It is not a panacea. It is not going to solve the dysfunctionality of our regions. Uh, but indeed, it will be a major contribution to, our, to, to the solidity or, or not to the solidity, but to the spirit of our peace with Egypt, for example. It is a, very important. I think that the peace between Israel and Egypt stood uh, uh, um, uh, uh, many, many tests in the past and survived and prevailed. But the spirit of that peace can be improved, can be warmer, obviously through an agreement with the Palestinians. Right, I'm going to uh, open this up for questions uh, if uh, people identify themselves. And start in the corner here. Front panel, sorry. Ah, sorry, we're going to bring round a microphone. I apologize. Thanks. Bob Pelletro, American Academy of Diplomacy. Uh, Shlomo, your remarks uh, show that you are uh, still and always a champion of peace. Uh, the other uh, article in today's New York Times that you didn't really mention was Khalil Shikaki's poll of Palestinians uh, showing a increase in Palestinian support for violence. And uh, underlying that, it seems to me, must be uh, 
a feeling among too many Palestinians that there is not really much strength, much drive behind the Annapolis process, and that their <laughs> leader in the peace process, uh, Abu Mazen, uh, hasn't really appealed to a lot of different constituencies. My question is, uh, well, let's say there are so many splits in the Palestinian community these days. It isn't just Fatah and Hamas. It is generation versus generation. It is religious versus secular, uh, not in a party connection. It's West Bank against uh, Gaza. Uh, it's Klan versus Klan, mm -hmm. even. Uh, my question basically is, um, are there things, in your view, that the United States and that Israel uh, could do beyond what they're doing to strengthen the constituencies uh, behind uh, Abu Mazen? Um, and mm. we need to think imaginatively about this. These aren't easy. They might run everything from uh, release of Marwan Barghouti mm. to uh, uh, much larger prisoner releases to uh, larger inflows of, of funds. But I'd like to hear you uh, uh, discuss what we could each do to further strengthen Abu Mazen. Well, I fully agree with your uh, definition of the state of uh, the Palestinian the Palestinian system. If I if I may just uh, add an input, uh, my my, my uh, uh, words or my uh, definition would be that there is a, a struggle between the inside and the outside. You know that uh, when when Arafat uh, came uh, in the wake of the Oslo Accords, it was like the outside sort of imposing itself on the inside. Now there we see a weakening of the inside, of the outside, and the re-emergence of the forces of the of the inside. That is the younger generation, and Fatah being the core, uh, the core struggling group of the inside, and 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 that is a struggle that again, if uh, we fail in the in the in these negotiations, uh, then the, the outside will be definitely doomed. The outside here we mean essentially what we call sometimes the moderates, uh, those we need to to strengthen and empower, etc. So I think that, uh, um, and, and of course there is a loss of, of, uh, 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 of faith in, uh, in, in the state and in the, in the institutions of, uh, of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, th this business of non-state agents ap appear all over the Middle East now. It's not, only in, uh, not, it's not only in Palestine. So I think that you are absolutely right in your, in your uh, definition. And uh, the problem is that uh, the whole discourse and the whole uh, policy of strengthening Abu Mazen hasn't worked so far. First, because neither the Americans nor we, the Israelis, delivered what we, 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 what we were supposed to deliver. The, um, Ehud Barak would not take today any decision that has exclusively to do with Annapolis, but only if it is sustained by, by what he and the security establishment would say, these are security considerations. So he would not remove um, uh, roadblocks are necessary just to please Abu Mazen. That recently, he didn't even go to the meeting with General Fraser, uh, the, the, the tripartite meeting. He sent Amos Gilad. Okay, but, but Israel is interested in a ceasefire in Gaza, not beyond, uh, 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 viewed from the <coughs> security system. Uh, and then you have the strengthening Abu Mazen by stopping settlements, for example. What happened recently is that Ehud Barak tried to broker with the settlers an agreement on uh, dismantling illegal outposts. But he did it by negotiating with them the expansion of settlements, quid pro quo. That is, he will allow them to expand uh, given settlements and the, the prime minister vetoed that. Ehud Olmert, he told me personally that he vetoed that, that but that was the position of, of, the, of, uh, of the defense minister. So. I I've frankly uh, uh, see that, uh, that as far as the conditions on the ground, Israel is not being excessively generous. Because, again, the dysfunctionality of the system, the fact that, that uh, um, uh, the defense minister is uh, as, uh, as, as strong in the government as the prime minister himself, and uh, he doesn't have to uh, uh, 
to accept instructions from, from the Prime Minister. And this is, uh, this is his view, his position. Now, with regard to Barghouti, I, I frankly think that this is a major thing to do. And I uh, sensed an interest also in my conversation uh, here in uh, that uh, this is a question that, uh, that preoccupies them, that, uh, that is of interest. Uh, how would the release of Barghouti serve uh, Abu Mazen? But this is for Abu Mazen and uh, to say if uh, the release of... Uh, uh, I think it would serve him. Again, this is an, a position from the outside. And, uh, uh, but this is something for the Palestinians to, s to say if this is vital for them. I believe it is. Um, and I'll tell you why. Uh, and. Uh, and this is not only in Palestine, also in Israel it happens. So it is not, I'm not trying to be condescending towards anybody. This is also the Israeli case. Civilian leaders in situations of conflict of this nature need a military man on their side. One was destroyed already, Dahlan. He is ruled out for the moment. He has lost his uh, popularity, his capacity, etc. Uh, um, and, and therefore, I think that, that uh, uh, the, in the current stage of Palestinian nationalism, in the current state of Palestinian nationalism, the democratic legitimacy of Abu Mazen is very important, but no less important is the revolutionary legitimacy, because this is a moment of struggle where you need to combine the two legitimacies, and it happens in Israel as well. The, every prime minister needs a good general on his side. Different setup, different stage in our uh, 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 development as nations, as states, but essentially the same problem. So I think it will be most helpful if indeed we release uh, Marwan Barghouti. I have a, a very good Palestinian friend who thinks that uh, if released, uh, Barghouti should be sent to exile because if he remains in Ramallah, he will be destroyed by the petty politics of the, of the place. <laughs> I'm going to bring the conversation and take three questions from, uh, from this end of the table close to us, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move to the table that seems to have most hugs in the, uh, in, in the back corner there. I, I, I would just add, I think in 2008, the, the notion that was on the table in 93 with the PLO that you withdraw from the armed struggle recognize Israel up front and negotiate and make nice with America, almost a Faustian bargain in Palestinian terms. It's difficult for that to have credibility in 2008. And the Hamas rejection of that equation is ideological, but it's also derived from a practical uh, Palestinian experience in which Palestinians have to, I would argue, reassume ownership of the two-state project. The two straight project seems less, uh, less to be a Palestinian-owned project, and I think recapturing re revolutionary legitimacy would, would be part of that. I'd like to, to give the floor to Ambassador um, Abdelaziz, Ambassador Mansour, and my colleague Jeff Laurenti, who heads the foreign policy program here at the Century Foundation. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. And, um, and um, I, I would like to extend a um, warm welcome to um, uh, Shlomo. Uh, we have dealt together with uh, 2,000 um, uh, proposals, presidential proposal on how to settle the Palestinian-Israeli uh, question. At that time, I was uh, as, uh, as an advisor to the president, and um, and I'm glad that I'm here to discuss another yet another proposal yeah. after <laughs> another presidency <laughs> has has already uh, is already the, over the, and the, the, the closer to the end of the process is a recipe for longevity. <laughs> <laughs> And also closer to the end of the of the presidency, so that um, we we can assess how how can we better do with this um, with this. I'm glad that we agree that um, on the basic premises that you can't confront Hamas in Gaza, but you have to contain them, and that has been always one of the main factors that we have been uh, uh, advocating, and that's why we were hoping that Israel, United States, and uh, European Union would support the coalition government under the leadership of President Abbas when it was when it was formulated about two and a half years ago. That would have prevented the split that happened recently. Has Israel extended its support to uh, Mahmoud Abbas, and has the United States and United European Union as well extended this support? This would have 
led us to a totally different situation. Also, I can't um, uh, relieve Israel from the responsibility of what happened in Gaza recently. Uh, has uh, Israel, yes, we know the problem of Qassam rockets and uh, we know uh, the, the, but Israel is taking also some severe military actions and it's resulting in massive human uh, casualties on the Palestinian side as a response to that and added with suffocation of the Palestinians in, in Gaza. I don't think that this, this is uh, the right solution. This, uh, we had no other choice except to allow the Palestinians to go to Egypt and, uh, and, uh, and in order to satisfy their humanitarian needs. And, um, but also Israel is not helping with the Annapolis process through the continuation of the settlement uh, activities and those uh, lately announced uh, settlements in Abu Ghanim and in other places. This is also running counter to uh, the basic commitment that at the first phase of the, um, uh, uh, of the Annapolis implementation, we're going to try to implement the roadmap with all, with all its aspects. When it comes to security, security, when it comes to settlement, is settlement. I agree that um, that uh, ceasefire is very important, but uh, it has to be coupled with uh, with some kind of political will and political negotiations. I don't know how this. And there, there come my first question: Do you see that the appointment of um, of the American envoy, uh, General Fraser, is only concentrating on the on the military aspect of the of the problem, or is it is it uh, a concentration on the political aspect of the problem? I personally see it concentration on the military yeah, aspect, yeah. and I see that there has to be much more emphasis on the political aspect um, of the uh, of the of the problem. The second is uh, as we approach uh, second of how many? <laughs> no, <we're> just second. <laughs> second no, of two. Is nothing okay. more. As as we approach the end of 2008, uh, do you agree with those assessments that there is not going to be any kind of agreement before the end of 2008, or do you see that there is as I see, that there could be agreement as a framework agreement or as a basic agreement on basic principles that could be signed between the parties and that could be transferred to the next administration and to use it from the first year, not in the last year, and uh, to try to come up with, with some kind of solution or to build on it to have some kind of, um, of understanding. Thank you. And I, I'm going to take three questions together, if, if you don't mind, uh, Ambassador and, and, and Jeff. To add my voice to the voice of uh, my brother and friend Majid in uh, welcoming uh, Shlomo among us. I read a lot about you and I uh, was following your news, but this is the first time that I meet you in person. And uh, I'm happy that I was able you know, to meet you in person. With regard to your presentation, I agree with you with regard to the ceasefire in Gaza. And the ceasefire in Gaza is not only an interest for uh, Israel in terms of the security issue in Gaza, but this is an interest for the Palestinian people. And President Abbas is very active in trying to help in all possible ways, including with the Americans and also with our Egyptian brothers to facilitate reaching a ceasefire. And even beyond that, that the administration of President Abbas uh, is uh, also articulating a position that for a ceasefire to succeed, the issue of the crossings should be addressed. And in this regard, uh, Prime Minister uh, Fayyad suggested to the Council of Foreign Ministers of Europe and also to the Quartet on the eve of uh, Paris meeting that the Palestinian Authority, the Presidential Guard, would step up to the plate and would assume the responsibility of the six crossings from the Palestinian side. So just to clear the record that not only that we are interested, but we are very active in terms of finding practical solution to the issue of putting an end to the misery of the Palestinians in Gaza, because if we want the camp of peace among the Palestinians to have uh, a larger clout in paving the way for the future, we need to win the hearts and minds of Palestinians in Gaza 
which that we are in the forefront of trying to find a solution, uh, a long-lasting solution, if one can think of one under occupation, uh, for the people in Gaza by opening the borders for the movement of people and uh, goods. But let me just uh, comment in the general thrust of your analysis. I think it is not fair nor constructive to genuine peace to keep placing so many responsibilities in the shoulder of the Palestinians. If the narrative is seen from that perspective and minimizing divisions among the Israelis, particularly in government, and more specifically of not being very candid in analyzing the position of the extreme radicals in the Israeli government, whom they are, in my opinion, responsible for sabotaging all efforts for peace. Because it would be ridiculous, in my opinion, to say that Hamas is the party that is going to sabotage peace. If Hamas to stand against the United States, I, I, did not say I, I know, I'm, I'm just I'm taking some of the thinking to its okay. ultimate conclusion. If people say that Hamas is capable of sabotaging peace and therefore capable of standing against all the forces of Annapolis led by the United States and capable of facing the Israeli government and for them to succeed, I think that this is a farce. This is a camouflage, in my opinion, to camouflage the true position of extreme radicals in the Israeli side who are not interested in peace and that they try to look for excuses which Hamas is providing through shooting these toys known as the rockets. And I believe if there is no political will, number one in the United States since they are the leaders of Annapolis, and I agree with you that uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, even President Bush, and he said that to us in meetings with President Abbas, that he is very genuine in trying to reach a peace treaty by the end of this year. Peace treaty cannot be reached between the two sides. We know when we know that there are radicals in both sides who do not want peace. One of them is a super radical in the Israeli side. The other one is a miniaturized radical in the Palestinian side. But if we allow those radicals to dictate the course of the process, I would say that we are not going to reach peace. Let me just move to the West Bank. Put, I, I know, but in the West Bank, now it has been more than 100 days since Annapolis. We don't see any indication or behavior by the Israeli government, whether in relation to settlements or checkpoints which increase from 548 to 580, or in the issue of prisoners, or in the issue of siege of Gaza, or with regard to opening our institutions in the West, uh, in the in East, East Jerusalem. Then, when we read in the New York Times a Shakaki, you know, uh, uh, survey, it is an obvious thing. It's not that the Palestinians are moving in the direction of becoming sympathetic to. Uh, abhorrent operations like the one that happened in West Jerusalem. But when the Palestinians see that the peace process is not giving the results that they were expecting, then it is not Abu Mazen or Salam Fayyad. It is that you will not be able to find a Palestinian leader that can promote this process that is not delivering. And it does not require a nuclear physicist to realize that if the Israeli leaders, especially Olmert, that he is interested in paving the way for peace, and I believe that he is interested, but he has his own problems. I think that he has to start showing, in practical sense, freezing the settlements, removing checkpoints, making the life of Palestinians in the West, ba West Bank uh, bearable in comparison to the situation now, then when we have opinion polls, then one can see that Abu Mazen is popular. But when you see the situation is now more miserable than before, then the results are obvious. 
In this connection, I just want to say that I, have to ask you to close I, I will close. Thank you. We, we are the inventors of the two-state solutions. We are in the PLO, the ones that articulated this position since 1973-74. And President uh, Arafat uh, put all of his political weight to move in that direction. But unfortunately, although we did not have Hamas with the same intensity or the elections, but the radicals in the Israeli sides refused to allow after an after uh, Oslo agreement to allow for this approach to, to happen. I will end up with the question, how do you see the American role unfolding in the next few months in a practical sense to salvage the Annapolis uh, process? Thank you. Yeah, uh, Jeff Laurenti, and I don't have any comment, just two very brief tactical <laughs> questions. First is, what's the degree of autonomy that the security uh, establishment in Israel has? Because when you think that calm is beginning to descend, one reads of an assassination that has uh, you know, taken out a couple other Palestinian, uh, quote, terrorists, and then it reopens the kind of retaliation b uh, back and forth. Um, do they, for every such action, do they have to have political okay, political approval? And if so, what are the politicians thinking uh, in approving it when it, it seems always to be just derailing what could be some promising uh, quiet. And second, is it fair to, to think that Annapolis has maneuvered the European Union and Russia out of the game altogether? That is, was it kind of a trapdoor that opened in which our European friends and, and Russians disappeared? Uh, do they have any role left and do they have any role in, in uh, upholding and sustaining and supporting whatever settlement may emerge. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, um, um, you asked about uh, political negotiations, that, that is whether, whether or not uh, Fraser uh, is in the business of political negotiations. My sense is that he is not, and uh, because this is not the, the, the philosophy of, uh, of the current administration, that is that uh, he is in order uh, there to oversee the implementation or of the security measures uh, uh, pertaining to the roadmap, to the first stages of the roadmap. And, uh, and this is the context where he tried, he met with Salam Fayyad and was supposed to meet also with uh, Barak and didn't meet. Um, the, and, and the involvement of the Americans, as you surely know, uh, with regard to the ceasefire in Gaza is mainly through the Egyptians. It's uh, not, uh, they have no direct uh, contact with, uh, with, uh, with Hamas or any other political force. Uh, as to, as to uh, what is the vision of Olmert when this uh, uh, deal can be, can be struck, um, I think that uh, his view is that uh, this is something that may take even beyond 2008. Uh, he was very happy uh, to hear from Ehud Barak that uh, he would, he would like to stay in the coalition until the spring of 2009. That is more or less the understanding of these two, uh, of these two leaders. And uh, he said more than once that he believes that uh, the Annapolis process will go beyond to, uh, to, uh, to 2008. Uh, your your, your uh, discourse, Ambassador, was perfectly coherent. I'm, uh, I, I'm fully aware that uh, the the um, need to uh, to create conditions for uh, the Palestinian Authority, the, the the government of Abu Mazen, uh, to be effective and to and to and to be popular are not being put in place. I'm fully aware of that. And and uh, 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 in my in my presentation, I said very clear that we have a problem with the two political systems. That is, I'm not trying to put all the blame on the Palestinians. The, uh, the, the this functionality of the Israeli political system has always been a major problem. A major problem for delivering, from coming to decisions. What is this business, for example, of, uh, of postponing uh, the negotiations on Jerusalem? How can uh, you have any kind of uh, quid pro quo if you don't put everything on the table? Uh, so this, is, this comes from uh, Shas. Nonetheless, I think that they are negotiating Jerusalem and somehow they are playing games. Um, I, I am aware that uh, uh, there is a problem with the radicals in Israel. Nonetheless, I would like to tell you this. Uh, the, the living space of radicalism in Israel, radicalism as we understood it in the 70s and the 80s and even the 90s, has been narrowed, has been narrowed. 
and mainly because of Ariel Sharon. You see, Ariel Sharon succeeded where Rabin failed. He uh, people voted for Rabin in the 90s, in the early 90s, because they believed that this person will draw into the peace process the right of center and perhaps even the right. Rabin failed. He was assassinated almost as a spokesman of peace now. Sharon managed to draw into, he didn't uh, use the term peace process, okay, but into the mainstream of how to reach some sort of a settlement, even if through unilateral measures. He drew the right of center and elements in the right and dissolved Likud. Now, and dismantled settlements. So I think that today, the, the capacity of the Hanan Porats, of the Levingers, of, uh, of these people to torpedo major processes is not the same as they, they are still there. They expand settlements, they pose a problem. Mafdal, for example, the party of the settlers is now a very small party. Again, if you, if you see the, the split in the Knesset, you would see that in the, in the next Knesset, according to all opinion polls, the right would be a majority, accord, according to the, to the polls. But then how do you define exactly the right today? Because when you say radicals, you don't mean necessarily Likud. You mean the, 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 the staunch supporters of greater Eretz Israel. These people today exist, they are there, but they are less of a, of a formidable challenge than years before. And obviously, they can still uh, pose problems in terms of creating difficulties for this uh, peace process. I fully agree with you that Hamas cannot be interested. This is things that, uh, something they have been saying for, for a long time. Hamas cannot be interested in actively sabotaging the peace process. I sense that this is their position because they understand that the peace process will fall on its own weight. Why be seen as somebody that torpedoes the peace process. Therefore, uh, the clashes with the Israeli army and the Qassam missiles is not, in, is not in order to derail the peace process. They have other intentions. So I think that, uh, um, and, and therefore this is the test of everybody of us, to try and reach a settlement, contrary to what uh, Hamas would expect, that Israel and the Palestinians cannot reach a deal uh, between them. So I, I, I fully agree that uh, this is not the strategy of Hamas and, and our strategy should be to reach a settlement so that the expectation of Hamas that the, 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 the process will fail by itself with no help from outside um, doesn't work. Uh, practically the American role as I understand again is that uh, they will use the president not to the degree that uh, Clinton was involved. This is a different profile of a president. And uh, he will not go into the intricacies of the process as Clinton went. And is there uh, now, um, is the uh, military establishment autonomous? It is powerful. It is powerful. And, uh, and uh, the military establishment in Israel uh, is, uh, is respected by the politicians. And when uh, the defense minister comes to the cabinet and says that this needs to be done and uh, intelligence services back him, it is very difficult for ministers to stand against. So there is a, there is, this is an establishment that contrary to the government has uh, uh, mechanisms of decision making of thinking about projects, of devising ideas, and ministers don't have that. Ministers come, they listen to uh, four generals, uh, the Air Force, the intelligence services, the chief of the Mossad, they say, listen, I don't want to take responsibility. If they say that this is vital for the existence of the state of Israel, who am I? It's a Shas, I'm a rabbi, I'm nothing. <laughs> So I think that this is the, the oddities of the Israeli political system are very clear. I mean, there are some other uh, things that are perhaps advantages, but here you see that operating. I mean, uh, um, there is no, uh, I always say that uh, the, the, the Israeli political system is, uh, is hostage to three elites. One is the military, 
The second is the officials of the Ministry of Finance. And three is the judiciary. Um, these are the three elites that limit the space of politics in Israel. Politics are very poor. Uh, politicians do not have, uh, they are uh, elected officials, but they have less power than these three elements that are not elected officials. And when I say the judiciary, I mean, for example, well, we have, uh, we have uh, been uh, world champions in establishing commissions of, inst of investigation for everything. So the minister said, no, 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 I don't want, uh, tomorrow they will have a commission of investigation and they will see that I say don't put a roadblock. And now they, they didn't put the roadblock and five people were killed and there is a, commis a commission of investigation and I am responsible. No, 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 if he says so. Let, so we are over, over legalistic. We have a, 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 um, an, an overwhelmingly active judicial system. We have a powerful military establishment. We have an objective sense, obviously, of threat that gives power to the, to the, to the, to the establishment. And therefore, politics, the, the, the space for politicians is very narrow. This is the simple reality. So, uh, Ambassador, did I say something about the dysfunctionality of the Israeli political <laughs> system as well? <laughs> And, uh, no, no, I understand, I understand, yeah, yeah. Uh, about uh, Europe, I think that Europe uh, uh, I I is absent in this process, frankly. Uh, they have always wanted to be players and not only payers, but uh, they, they, do, they did not uh, get to that stage, really. Uh, Europe doesn't have a common foreign policy. Um, Angela Merkel is one thing, or Sarkozy is another, uh, Blair is not there anymore, and Brown is, for the time being, less interested in, uh, in issues uh, of the Middle East. Solana is a very good man, but uh, he doesn't really represent the collectivity of, uh, of, the Palestine, of, the, of the Europeans, and therefore Europe is not really there. The European idea is very inspiring, but, inspiring, but it does not intimidate. Uh, but Amer America intimidates, but does not inspire in the recent <laughs> years. <laughs> we're, we're running over time, but if, if there are a couple of quick questions and quick answers, then I will allow those to be taken. Okay, I think we're gonna we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that because we've run beyond our uh, beyond our two thirty. What, what I would like to say is that many of you have been here at these sessions before uh, TCF lunchtimes on the Middle East. Uh, many of you haven't, and I'm glad to see you here. Uh, it's a tradition we've tried to institute since we've had the Prospects for Peace program running. We've been bringing voices over from the region, not, not always as, uh, as eloquent, articulate, and, and, and in-depth of Shlomo, but we do try. Um, and, and it's something we're going to continue. As I said, next Tuesday will be our next event, uh, looking at Dan Kurtzer and Scott Lazinski's new book on the, the American role, uh, the uninspiring intimidator. Um, and we might... Remember that sentence for next week and throw that at our, at our guest speakers. Um, I, would, I, I, I would like to thank Richard Leone, who's, who's at the back there, the, 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 the president of the Century Foundation, for hosting us here, and my colleague Jeff Laurenti. I'd especially like to thank Michael Hanna, who, who runs the Prospect for Peace program out of our New York office, and Emily O'Brien and, and, and Emily and, and, and Denna Millay, uh, without whom this absolutely wouldn't have happened because they've been uh, doing the heavy lifting on all these events. Um, but most of all, I'd like to thank you, Shlomo for spending your, your, your lunchtime with us and for sharing your thoughts with us. And I think giving us uh, a rich appreciation of, of a way of looking at what's going on and a, and a lot to think about and take home. Um, and thank everyone for joining us this lunchtime. And I hope to see you all here so soon. Thank you. Thank you.